Start the recording. Here we go. Okay, Lori. Right. Well, welcome everybody. We uh, are we have had a couple of changes to our program this month. We were supposed to hear from the winners, the astronomy winners of the Rio Rancho High School's science fair. Um, Melanie and I were supposed to help judge that, but unfortunately, they they had to call it. Um, so we are very fortunate to have uh, Dr. Jack Drummond here to speak, and I'll let Steve introduce him in just a moment. But first, do we, Melanie, do you want to make any announcements? Our fundraiser is still scheduled for May. We're expecting things to be calmed down by then, and it'll be warm enough to be outdoors. Yeah, hopefully. I am looking for a guest speaker. I'm considering the lady who is going to be our next month's guest speaker. Um, on March the 4th is our next meeting and our guest speaker is going to be Dr. Deanna Drahomir from UNM. She is, uh, she's come out once in the past, a couple of years ago, and uh, she is one of the people that has discovered on her own a, an exoplanet um, with some of the stuff that she's done, with some of her research. And she is also one of the people that is one of the principals of the James Webb Telescope here at UNM. I'm like, oh my God! You know, so Yay, she's going to be able to, Webb. I'm like, Yay! <laughs> you know, so she's going to talk to the kids. She was supposed to talk to the kids this morning, but because we had at, at school, but because not the ones running around in t-shirts and shorts though, but um, a little bit older kids. Um, and so we decided to postpone her talk at school till, till next weekend, because otherwise until next Friday, because she would have had a short, a short time, but I'm really considering having her come out because by then James Webb will have been there and just about ready to start looking at its new at its new thing so maybe, maybe something that we can do because i know that she's got a lot of activities that we could do that are related to james webb um jim greenhouse has a lot of activities that are related to james webb that we could have you know in addition to her speaking about um this telescope and so i thought maybe you know that that's what do you guys think that would that be an option that sounds great i think that sounds good yeah Okay, you know, because I know that she she's got um, a bunch of stuff with you know some activities with spectroscopy and different things that was going to talk about how and different things that was going to talk about that how that how the <laughs> web will be able to tell atmosphere on planets and st and the exoplanets and stuff like that. So that'd be kind of cool. And um, the astronomy club is now the proud owner. We're going to use it for the very first time tonight um, of, of a telephone. <laughs> the telephone <laughs> number for the astronomy club it's on the website now. I don't know where. Yeah, here we go. Darren actually put it on the website. So instead of having people call me about stuff, I've got it sitting here in case people are gonna go, where are you at the observatory? The phone number for this tele telephone is 505-430-9604. If you guys are interested in having that um, in, in your, um, you know, in, in your files and stuff, um, I'm gonna start writing it on the backs of the, um, the business cards that we have and then from then on from now on out i'll put it on the once we get rid of course i just got a new business cards just not too long ago you know about six months ago but of course we'll we'll get rid of these and you know then i'll have it on the business card too so we put, have a um, on the telephone website. and a hot spot i put the phone number on the website on the officer's page the, club, the official club mail address there, I, I can't there. hear you. There's something, there's some, some noise, some background noise somewhere. Can you hear me now? Yeah, sure. that's better. Okay. All right. The uh, phone number is on the, uh, on the website. It's, all, it's on the officer's page. Uh, on the right hand side, where I have the official club address, I put the phone number underneath that. Also, too, uh, it's, it's on the uh, front page uh, at the meeting announcement saying, you know, for further uh, more information, call that number. So did anybody call it, Melly? Not yet. I'm I'm waiting to see anybody getting there and going, we're freezing. Where are you? <laughs> so okay, well, that's that's about it. We're we're working on some stuff, you know, on, on the coming up. So we'll we'll just kind of see, see what's going on. You know, and just um haven't really done a whole lot of outreach recently. But then now hopefully we can start picking up some of that again a little bit as well. And they still aren't checking the telescopes out at the library. Um, I spoke to the um, the director a couple of times and uh, 
they're like, oh, we're afraid. And I'm like, oh, dear God. So I'm going to go over there and actually talk to the person in charge of it and say, all right, look, what can we do to get to get this moving forward again? I would think it'd be just a matter of swabbing them down with alcohol. That's what we've told them. I'm what I've told them several times and they're still um, very reluctant. John, what did you do when you were doing the telescopes at the library? Because you, um, uh, they, they quit doing that right when COVID hit, right? Right. Right. There haven't been any, as far as I know, they haven't loaned any telescopes out, you know, since COVID. And prior to that, I was just stopping by regularly to maintain them. Uh, you know, they occasionally have issues with them with a, the alignment gets messed up or uh, usually the collimation holds pretty well. But once in a while, the finder scopes are, are out of alignment. Um, just I check the... Uh, to make sure there's not a lot of fingerprints on the eyepieces. One person at some point took apart one of those eyepieces and uh, completely screwed it up. But for the most part, they've been well treated and they work fine. Um, just a little bit of alcohol on the, uh, the eyepiece lenses is probably what they need. And, uh, you know, gentle treatment is what they need. The yeah, they primary- have a, um, a spray bottle that they were gonna just spritz alcohol, you know, on it, let it sit yeah. for 24 hours or so. That'd work. Right. Yeah, just, they don't, they don't wanna be spraying the primary mirror with alcohol. That would be bad. They don't need to do that. No. But one of us, you know, one of us could wipe the eyepieces every once in a while with a very gently with a Q-tip and some isopropyl alcohol. And that's probably what they need for the eyepieces. And it's an eyepiece yeah. that's permanently in there, semi-permanently in there until people monkey with it. It's a, a zoom eyepiece mm -hmm. that's perfect for those telescopes. Um, yeah. No I'm reason not to by. check them out. No, I know. I'm going to drive by um, uh, next week sometime and and go and say, look, you know, what what the heck, you know, let let's rework this and let's get moving forward again. Or you're muted. So, and Ron's got some. We got some telescopes that Ron and I've been working on too. That we're gonna st hopefully start doing a loaner program through through the club too a little bit. Okay, that sounds that sounds good. Um, if there are no more announcements, um, oh Roger, you're muted. Roger. You're muted. You're, you're muted, press the space bar. So we were talking about the phones a little while ago, and I thought we had concluded that it was supposed to live at the observatory. Yes, no, maybe so. If it lives at the observatory, if anybody calls it, nobody's gonna answer it. <clears throat> you can set it up to forward calls to you. But then it also has to be on. Hmm. and charged okay so i i think as long as um whoever has it is going to be there and if there's something that's going to prevent them from being there when we need it they'll have to it'll be an extra layer of complication it'll be an extra it layer won't be anything i gotta to, deal with that's for sure <laughs> having to pass the phone to someone else but i think we can manage it and besides melanie's our observatory manager and is there almost every time the place is open anyway. But if uh, she phone ever hand has off to be is gone, pretty easy. Yeah. If she <laughs> ever has to be gone, I'll she can drop it by my place on her way and I'll give her her bumper sticker. Yeah, because the account is set up under the club's name anyway. So all I have to do is if, if the phone if somebody else is in charge of the phone, it's just a matter of just handing it off. You know, yes. Like, uh, like, That's, like the, yes, you know, like the football that goes with the president. Right. <laughs> Plus, we're not quite that serious, but anyway. All Hopefully right. Hopefully not. All right. So, uh, Steve, in, in fact, if there's no other announcements, then um, would you like to introduce our speaker? Thank you, Lori. Um, 
Our speaker tonight is, of course, uh, oh gosh, Jack. My goodness, am I having Dr. a senior Jack moment? Dr. Jack Drummond. That's what I thought, yeah. Drummond. <laughs> I'm having a senior moment, I tell you. I woke up this morning at four o'clock. <laughs> so, oh, well, Dr. Jack Drummond uh, is, uh, gosh, he's got a fantastic career. Uh, we have a really interesting presentation from him that kind of goes over all of the highlights of what he's gone through. Uh, and I think without further ado, why don't I go ahead and just do his presentation here real quick. And we shall see. And here it is. And I'll share sound. And here we go. You might want to turn the volume up on your computer because the volume is a little low. So here it goes. And from the beginning, poof. Here we go. Thank you for inviting me to your Perihelion event. I would like to take advantage of the invitation and look back in time to see how I got here. To put it in chronological context, I have five children, 11 grandchildren, and two great-grandchildren. For those of you who are still raising kids, these would be your kids' grandchildren. Wow, can you see that far ahead? I'm gonna try to look that far back. I'll begin in the summer of 1957. We had just moved to Key West, Florida from the Azores. My father was a was in the Navy, and in the summer of 1957 was a bright opposition to Mars, and from paintings like this, I knew there was life on Mars and elsewhere in the universe, and I knew that there were beings on Mars who were looking at us. I was really excited about astronomy. I went to Hialeah High School in Miami-Dade, Florida. It was a large high school, 8,000 kids in 10th through 12th grades. And it was only five years old at the time. My favorite subject was study hall. I would uh, take a nap, especially during football season, get my homework done. And then since the study hall was adjoining the library, I would go over there. I read every astronomy book in the library and every science fiction book in the library. After playing football for three years, I finally got a chance to start at defensive back my senior year. Based on the fact that we, our incoming new coach was a, an all-conference tight end from the University of Florida, Hylia High School was ranked number eight in the state of Florida before the season started. However, we lost the first five games, so the coach benched the seniors in favor of the juniors. That was probably the toughest time in my life, sitting on the bench, enduring practices, knowing I would never play again. So I found my stride, though, in track. I ran the high hurdles and the low hurdles, and at the Gold Coast Conference Southern Division, which were the Miami schools, I actually won high, both the high and the low hurdles. Then the winners went on to compete in the Northern Division, Fort Lauderdale schools, and again I won the high, but I finished third in the low hurdles and injured myself. So I did not go on to the district or the states, but I had discovered that I was a hurdler. I also caught future Hall of Famer Charlie Huff when I played city baseball with him. Charlie was two years younger than me. He had a mean fastball with just a flick of his wrist. But in the majors, he switched to knuckleball, and he lasted a long time. My interest in astronomy was continuing, and in the 11th grade, my father bought me a pair of 10 by 50 binoculars, but I couldn't use them. I, the stars were just too unsteady, and I really couldn't see anything. I reported this back to my father. He took the... the uh, binoculars down to the aviation shop at Eastern Airlines and rigged up a mount to put on his tripod. After that, I began to observe, but I still couldn't resolve binary stars according to the formulas in the books. So one night, I switched to trying to hunt down objects in sky and telescope. The first things I looked at were globulars M12 and M10 in Ophiuchus, and by golly, I could find them. So I started looking around for other things, and I got a really big thrill out of, find, out of finding galaxies like those in the tail of Leo and planetary nebula, which popped in and out of vision as you use avert, averted vision. In the summer before my senior year, I watched the Perseid meteor shower and then wrote an essay in it 
about it in English class and got the attention of my English teacher. And so I had become a writer. And in fact, I did publish in Sky and Telescope some observations I made of a penumbral eclipse that occurred that year. My report to Sky and Tell on pencil and notebook paper was on the penumbral eclipse. And in fact, Sky and Telescope let off their little article. That I was not only public, I was poetic. Look at that opening line as the copper moon sat on the horizon. So indeed, I was published. Out of high school, I applied to the University of Virginia, partly because I was born there and having been in a uh, Navy brat, did not really have a home state, but I was born in Virginia, so I picked the University Did things freeze up? You're muted, Steve. Uh, did we lose video? The, vid the video's gone. Steve, you're muted. Anybody here? Yeah, we're here. The video's um, back. We can hear you, but we're not hearing the. We're not hearing anything. We're not hearing the presentation. <clears throat> okay, let me stop sharing real quick. Let's try this again. Something happened. We all love technology. <laughs> it's wonderful when it works. Yeah, I thought it was uh, my. I thought the fault was on my end. I'm considering changes all changing all my passwords to I hate computers. <laughs> <laughs> all right, let's try this again. Let's go to okay. And from the current slide. Virginia. And also because they had an astronomy department. <laughs> The University of Virginia was founded by Thomas Jefferson, and he considered it one of his, the three greatest accomplishments in his life. He did not consider being a president of the United States one of his greatest, but instead authoring the Declaration of Independence, authoring the Declaration of Religious Rights for the state of Virginia, and founding the University of Virginia were his three greatest accomplishments. When I applied to the University of Virginia, I did not know that it was a men's only school. I didn't find that out till two months before I went to college. And it's probably a good thing. I had a hard enough time as it was getting through college without the distraction of girls around. <laughs> Nevertheless, I enjoyed my time at the University of Virginia, although I did study a lot and I wasn't a great student. At Virginia, I had a Navy ROTC scholarship and I ran track because that's who I thought I was. I lettered every year, but I never finished first in any of the track meets. The best I ever did was my junior year, I finished third in the indoor high hurdles, and my senior year, I finished fifth in the outdoor high hurdles. In the Atlantic Coast Conference Championships, I never got out of the preliminary rounds. I did major in astronomy there, and I was a serious but not a good student. I struggled in physics and math, and I never got anything, anything better than a D which was passing, unlike nowadays, that D minus is an insult added to injury, but I still passed those courses. I did know my astronomy though, and I graduated in 1967 with an outstanding 2.2 GPA. <laughs> That's being sarcastic. Mm -hmm. However, one of the major events of my undergraduate days was a trip I took to Hayden Planetarium in New York City in 1966. Took a Greyhound bus there. Oh yeah, here I am hurdling at the University of Virginia. Yes, I thought I could make the Olympics. 
But at the Hayden Planetarium, I picked up this little paperback book that really altered the direction of my life, Between the Planets by Fletcher Watson. In it, they describe, he described uh, the uh, orbital elements, and I tell you, I have gone back to this diagram many times over the last decades to, to figure it out and to remind myself what the elements meant. But in this book, he talked about asteroids and their light curves. And I could not fathom what would make an asteroid have a light curve. To me, they were tumbling. They wouldn't be periodic. But he showed illustrations of regular variations of asteroids. I just couldn't get around it, understanding it. But before I could really dive into it, I was commissioned as an ensign at the University of Virginia in 1967 and then began flight training in Pensacola, Florida, receiving my wings in 1968 in Corpus Christi, Texas. Then I was posted to Patunks River Naval Air Station to fly C-121s. Our squadron TDY to Vietnam in 1970, in fact, for quite a while, but uh, I went in 1970 and flew out of Saigon, Da Nang, and then Karat, Thailand. I came back to the States and eventually transferred to Richmond, Virginia, where I was an aviation recruiter and finished my obligated duty in 1972. Here are the planes I flew in the Navy. The top three are training aircraft, characterized by their distinctive orange and white paintings. And the bottom of the C-121 that I flew out of Tucson, Maryland and in, in Saigon and in Vietnam. The top one is the T-34. That was my first solo plane and that was another thrilling moment in my life the first time the pilot gets out of the back of the seat, back of the plane, and tells you you're on your own, come back and make two touch and go landings and then come back and pick me up. Wow, did I feel good after that. But even better was the second plane, the T-28. The first time you land on a carrier, you do it solo. There are no instructors in the plane. We flew out to the carrier in, in uh, groups of six in formation, broke off at the last second, and then made six touch and go landings two full stop landings and takeoffs, and then flew back to Pensacola. Now there, I was in the top of the world. In Vietnam, I flew the C-121s, which was an electronic aircraft. We would fly in circles about 7,000 feet off the coast, listening to radio chatter from North Vietnam and broadcasting radio and television to people in South Vietnam. We did this off of the coast of Vietnam when I was flying out of Vietnam and then over in Karat, Thailand. We would fly these uh, circles at 7,000 feet off the border of Cambodia. Yes, indeed, we brought television to Vietnam. On the right, I'm being promoted to lieutenant. That's the same as Air Force captain. And here's a picture of the flight crew when we flew out of Da Nang. From there, I went to the New Mexico State University to pursue graduate school to an astronomy degree in graduate school. Now, New Mexico State has a lot of fond memories for me. I was married, had children, was settling down into finally studying, uh, getting serious about astronomy. I continued my athletic career by winning the high hurdle championships, intramural championships, for four years in a row at New Mexico State. I also talked some fellow graduate students into playing intramural sports, including basketball early in the season. Our first game, we lost 80 to 20 against some fraternity. When the game was over, a little reporter came over and asked what, who we were, and I said we were biology. The next morning in the school, news, school uh, newspaper, it reported that biology had lost to some fraternity 80 to 20. Well, I'm sitting at my desk studying, and I hear a big commotion in our department's uh, chair's room and he says where's Drummond and he comes storming into the where I was and said are you responsible for this and just because I told him that uh, we were biology and we lost 80 to 20 uh, the biology department had got mad tracked down what really happened and came over and gave it to our department head and he turned around and gave it to me so we contended other sports but we really weren't any good after all we were students and scholars and not athletes but one day, walking through a practice field, I 
saw a team that was practicing for intramural football, and I stood around and watched them for a while, and then one of the guys came over and asked me if I wanted to play with him, and I said, sure. And he was Ray Birmingham. Well, Ray Birmingham is the current baseball coach at UNM, although he may have retired last year. He was a little guy, like 5'8", and he was fast. He won the 100, 200, and 400 out of Carlsbad High School, and he was a state championship uh, top rusher in, for the state in football. He had formed a, an intramural team at New Mexico State, but didn't have a quarterback, so he asked me if I wanted to try to be a quarterback. Well, I had played a little bit in and out in intramurals and at Virginia, so I played quarterback. And I built an intramural championship football team, which normally is everybody go out deep and I'll throw it to somebody. I, I put together a running team uh, built around Ray Birmingham. I would pitch the ball out to him and he'd outrun him to the, to the sideline and take off down the field. When the defense started to stack it against him, I would fake pitching to him and run up the middle. So we had a running game, which is unheard of in intramural flag football. And we won the intramural football ship championships two years in a row. That's probably the highlight of my football career. I also umpired in softball in the city to support graduate school for six years. I didn't play softball then because you couldn't umpire and play at the same time. In graduate school, I was serious, but not a good student. It sounds familiar. I struggled in physics and math, but I knew my astronomy. And I teamed up with a fellow graduate student to obtain light curves of asteroids. We put together what is still the record for the longest continuous light curve of an asteroid from one location. We got on series, the asteroid series at the end of twilight and stayed on it continuously until into, twi into twilight at uh, dawn. I also worked on a meteor patrol in which I'd go out and collect the films that, that we made every night uh, that were gathering spectra of meteors in addition to uh, their trails. I did my dissertation on planetary nebula of central stars because the advisor for Ed Tedesco, who was getting a degree in, in asteroids, advised me that he couldn't support me in my work because he had, was too busy. So I did it on planetary nebula, central, planetary nebula central stars. I did my observational thesis at Blue Mesa Observatory, which is no longer there. Now that was probably the most idyllic time at New Mexico State. I go down to Blue Mesa, which is between Deming and Las Cruces, sitting on a mesa. I'd fire up the generator, which was a loud son of a gun. But I could sit on the south-facing balcony and see the lights on I-10 going back and forth. And southeast of where I was, you could see the lights of uh, Las Cruces. I could I'd pick up our radio telephone. There was before a cell phone. So we had a radio telephone. I talked to my wife, and she'd be tucking in our little babies, all warm and cozy in the winter. And I would make one last contact her with her before I signed off, and I'd be the only human within 10 miles. I'd observe my planetary nebula at night, and in the daytime I'd do uh, bird watching around Blue Mesa. The 24-inch telescope was sold a few years later to a community college in Kansas, and now the graduate students there do their observational work at uh, at in at, at Sac Peak and the at Apache Point in Sac around Sac Peak. I was the ninth PhD granted by the department in 1980. They've had hundreds since then. Now, based on my work at uh, with the Meteor Patrol of New Mexico State, one day the department chairman came in and says our Meteor Patrol funding has dried up. They want a final report. So he told me to write it. Well, I didn't know anything about it. All I did was collect the film. But I started doing research into it. Uh, found a couple of meteors on a couple of the films that were seemed to be in parallel trails at two different times. I took the film over to a physical science lab, which was the research arm of the New Mexico State University. And they routinely took these films and derived their orbits from them because they worked mostly with uh, missiles out of white sand so they could do the orbits. Well, when, it came, when they came back with analysis, these two meteors indeed had very similar orbits. So I began to look into the literature about what it takes to call two orbits the same or, or similar. I found that there was a D, a D discriminant criteria, which I didn't really understand. 
but I finally delved into it enough and found that there was a mistake in what they had done. So I invented my own D discriminant, applied it to these two meteors and to prove that indeed they were related, and began to look at other meteor showers and comparing them to the orbits of comets that were in Marsden's catalog, I found a new association, as indicated by this arrow on the left. It was associating the Epsilon Geminids in October with Comet Ikea. And the reason it hadn't been found before was because this oversight in the discriminate, discriminant by Southworth and Hawkins, which is the last line in the equations on the right. This quantity should have been subtracted for retrograde orbit instead of added. And then in my discriminant, I did it right, I corrected theirs, and the association just popped out. So that was one of my first publications with orbit discriminants, and that since then has become uh, quite popular. Uh, in fact, a little book I picked up at the Planet Hayden Planetarium, and I still couldn't figure out how to, what made light curves, what, what made how like how asteroids made light curves. I would uh, I had picked up some I had done some assistant ships by working on for White Sands, and we had to take a a bus out there in the morning because uh, they didn't want that many cars coming into White Sands. They pack up those bus in the morning and head out there, and I spend the day and then come back. Well, on the trip out there and back especially in the summer, they would start up the Oregon Mountains, start up Oregon Pass. They would downshift that bus and downshift the bus and then turn the air conditioner off and I'd get sleepier and sleepier. And I started out scratching, trying to figure out the math of, of why they would make light curves, of asteroids make light curves, scr scrabbling on a notebook and end up with my head on the back of the seat dreaming and doing it in all my mind. But I finally did derive equations for a light curve from an asteroid, if I could assume that the asteroid were a triaxo-ellipsoid roti rotating about its, uh, its short axis. As you can see from the left, the light curve is maximum when it's over the equator, that is when theta is zero. And when it's over the pole, there is no light curve. I'll come back to this later. After New Mexico State University, I went to the University of Arizona in Tucson following fellow graduate student Ed Tedesco. He asked me to come out to work on speculative interferometry, and he thought it could be applied to, to asteroids. Asteroids at this point had never been resolved. They were merely points of light in the sky, but speculative interferometry was a technique that was promising, and it should, have, should be able to resolve asteroids and introduce a new field of study about resol uh, resolved asteroids. In Tucson, my kids went from elementary school through graduation from high school while I struggled to live on soft money. But I did enjoy myself. I st studied uh, asteroids with speculative interferometry and light curves. At the University of Arizona, I continued playing in, in, in roles played softball and formed a team from grad students and faculty from astronomy and the physics department and later optical sciences. And we won the championship, the faculty championship for four out of the five years. The only year we didn't win was when we lost to the ag department, graduate department, faculty uh, department, because we had to play on a short field because the field we normally played on was under construction and it hit the ball over the fence. It was a foul ball, the second one was an out. We could not keep the ball inside the park, end up making a lot of outs that way and lost the championship. However, it was a pretty darn good team. We actually went on a 17 game winning streak and in softball or baseball, that's a pretty darn good streak. We took, took it out into the Tucson City League and kept that winning streak going. <clears throh> I named the team Proto Stars, so we were the uh, Proto Stars in the faculty league and out into the city. But when we picked up students, uh, people from the optical sciences, I'd, we changed our name to the Infrared Sox. 
I worked at Stewart Observatory and the Lunar Planetary Lab, which are two different departments of universe at the university. As I said, working on speckled interferometry of asteroids. I derived the tri ellipsoid ratios and rotation pole from just like hers. Starting from that book I picked up in Hayden, working out the equations at New Mexico State, and now I've got them. Uh, I can apply them to like hers that was being acu that were being accumulated, and I published. A, with the data from the light curves that was obtained by the Planetary Science Institute there, uh, the actual ratios and rotation poles from some two dozen asteroids. And partly based on the work and partly based on the specular ferometry of asteroids that I did, uh, they, I was fortunate enough to have asteroid 46093 named after me. I also tried to connect asteroids with meteor streams based on my orbital discriminant. That generated a lot of interest. A lot of people have picked it up, but in the end, except for Phaethon and the Geminids, there is no conclusive uh, meteor streams that have been associated with asteroids. They still remain, uh, still is that meteor streams come from comets. When I was there, I did write, uh, I was a co-author on uh, two chapters in the Asteroids 2 book one on doing the photometry from the light curves, and the other from doing speculative interferometry. <clears throat> Here we have the FFT, or the Fourier transform of arrows, where the bottom half of the image is the data, and so we're actually resolving it because you can see it is resolved, and the top half is the model that I derived from my fits. And this was pretty revolutionary at the time, up to this point, asteroids had only been points of light in the sky. Nobody had ever resolved an asteroid till speculative interferometry in the 1980s. So, let's get to the asteroid. Let's get to the science. If the asteroid is not resolved, but you can get light curves, you can still get shapes and poles from light curves over many years. By shapes, I mean the actual dimensions. For instance, here's the... It, when you can produce, I can produce the so the so-called smile diagram. The top line is the ma is the brightness of the asteroid at maximum light, and the bottom line is at minimum light, <coughs> as a function of the sublatitude of the Earth. So when you're in the asteroid's equatorial plane, there's a big difference between the maximum and the minimum. And once you get over the pole, there is no light curve. The top curve shows how the change. In brightness of the maximum or the minimum changes with the solar phase angle. Now once you resolve <coughs> an asteroid you can all you can get the, not the shapes but the dimensions in the poles and from speckle interfer interferometry or adaptive optics in just one night rather than over many years this produces the winking diagram at the top. The Mac top is the maximum for this particular night the bottom is the minimum in the dimensions of the asteroid in the dimensions of the ellipse projected by the triaxoellipsoid asteroid. Uh, triaxoellipsoid asteroid. The bottom shows the change in position angle of that long axis of the ellipse. So, from asteroid light curves to resolved images to radius vector models, I determine the light curves yield axial ratios and pole. Resolved images use you can get the actual dimensions, actual dimensions in poles, and the radius vector models, which are derived from light curves. And I do not know how a European mathematician found a way to invert light curves into getting their shapes, uh, individual radius, uh, radii vector from the centers of the surface, some two, some thousands of them, to yield higher order shapes. So watch this. Here are the results of my study of asteroids by studying their light curves and resolved images. On the left is the projection of a 3 by 2 by one triaxial ellipsoid projects onto the sky as an ellipse with a long dimension and a short dimension as shown in the second column. And if you multiply those two, you get the brightness in the middle column, and that's a light curve. That amplitude of the light curve is maximum over the asteroid's equator, and then as you go down the column to 30 degrees plus 60 degrees from over the pole, the amplitude goes down. 
However, the asteroid itself gets brighter and brighter. Over the pole, there is no change in light curve amplitude in light curve or in the long and short dimension, but as shown on the right column, all the action is in the change of the position angle. And you can also follow the asteroid as it rotates, where I've drawn lines of latitude and longitude in the fourth column. This is a radius vector model of an asteroid. It shows the surface points of the radius vector. You put facets on it. You apply scattering laws. and then lines of longitude and latitude, and this is what an asteroid is to me. When I finally ran out of soft money at the University of Arizona, I had a friend at Starfire Optical Range who was an engineer, and he said there was an opening and invited me to apply. I came and interviewed with Bob Fugate for adaptive optics, which had just been declassified by the military and was fortunate enough to be hired. At Starfire, I used to jog around the hills, and they had a nice base, on-base gym that I used. I played softball for five years, went on base, took it out in the city for 17 years. The best time I played was playing with my son. In fact, for two seasons, we had five father-sons on the team. I retired in 2004 after 35 years, and looking back, I can say that when I put a team together, I could take a bunch of average players and turn them into a mediocre team. Some of the highlights from my time here at the SOR was a campaign put together by Bob Fugate in 1998 through 2000 to observe Leonid persistent meteor trails. These are mysterious trails that have been known since the first meteor storms of the 19th century. Unlike normal meteor trails, which will flare up and then leave a train that lasts a second or two, these will leave a train that lasts for up to an hour and no one really knew the reason for this so they put together a campaign from uh, involving scientists from Cornell and from University of Chicago we all gathered here to use a three and a half meter a three and a half meter telescope we had a, a lidar a sodium lidar which we could probe the trails to investigate them I'll talk more about that in a little bit and then in 2004 I retired from softball and in 2006 was perhaps the greatest day of my life. I had collaborated with the team, and we put together observation requests for the large telescopes, and we got one for Keck. But my two colleagues for this particular application uh, bowed out, they couldn't make it, so I went in by myself, and on August 16th, there I was, the largest telescope in the world, steering it around to my asteroids to, to uh, study them all night. When it was over, my wife joined me, and I spent another week in Kauai with, with my wife. And I would, this was the greatest day of my life. This international collaboration published papers on, uh, with observations from the Keck 10 meter, the Gemini 8 meter, and the BLT 8 meter. We observed das asteroids Daphne, Davida, Pallas, Lutetia, Europa, Ceres, and Psyche. For Lutetia and Ceres, we did our observations to just before a spacecraft visited them, and they wanted uh, our data so that they could plan their approach. We've done the same thing for Psyche, which in two years will be there will be another spacecraft visiting Psyche. And then later on, I really got involved with asteroid satellites. Uh, with my team, we discovered asteroid uh, the uh, Peneus around asteroid Daphne. Olympias around Roxanne, and then in 2016, I wondered if the SOR could see these satellites because the, so far the observations had been restricted to the very large telescopes, and by golly, we did find Romulus around Sylvia, which made the three and a half the smallest telescope to ever observe, ever observe an asteroid satellite. And we observed Olympias around Roxanne and derived the first orbit ever 
combining our SOR observations with the other large telescope ob observations, I published an orbit for it. Uh, earlier, uh, late last year, we looked at Linus around Calliope and derived an orbit. And then we found Linus around Calliope again with the one and a half meter, which then made it the smallest telescope in the world to observe an asteroid moon. At this point, I'd like to tell a story. A good story has a plot, a twist, a turn, tension, resolution, and then a moral to the story. A shaggy dog story has none of this. I'm going to tell you a shaggy dog story. In 1997, a fireball went from south to north over Albuquerque. My daughter saw it walking out of Walgreen. Bob Fugate says he saw it. I was driving home at the time and didn't see it. But it made the news. There were reports not only over Albuquerque, but from truckers driving the interstates north of Albuquerque. Furthermore, there was a report of fireballs landing in, U in California about two hours later. Well, Mark Boslow is a scientist at the uh, Sandia Lab. He was writing a hydrodynamic code to describe fireballs entering the Earth's atmosphere and he became in interested in this. So he had a theory that uh, perhaps this fireball had entered, ap entered the atmosphere over New Mexico, skipped the out of the atmosphere, and landed back in California. So he interviewed people all along the trajectory, and including uh, the UFO Museum, where he asked them if anything unusual had happened the previous night. And they said, oh no, just a fireball. But he did his calculations after the interviews and determined that the minimum altitude for this fireball was right over Roswell. So he said, I can't go out with a story about the fire, uh, fireball over Roswell. So what's the next nearest town? He looked at a map and said it was Portales. And to this day, this is known as the Portales fireball. Well, my, one of my main jobs, in fact, my main job in coaching and playing softball is to make sure that someone is going to bring beer for the next game and that we have enough players for the next game. We had two guys on our team named John and Z. Z was a short little Jewish fellow from New York City. He, he short and squat. He wasn't very good, so I always put him at catcher. But they were re reliable. They always came to the games. You could always count on them. Well, after one game, I told them this this uh, fireball story to the team. The next game, these guys came, and uh, when I came time to ask who was going to be around for the next game, they said they wouldn't make it. I couldn't believe it. They're, they're always there. I said, well, how come you're not going to be at the game? Well, they were going to go down to the uh, UFO festival in Roswell on the 50th anniversary of the Roswell incident, and they wanted to buy my story. I said, what do you mean? He said, they have an auditorium down there where people pay two bucks to go in and listen to stories about UFOs from other people, and they particularly like stories about government cover-ups. And this was clearly a government cover-up calling it the Portalis and not the Roswell Meteor. So I said, sure, take the story down there. The next game they weren't there. The following game they came back and I asked how it went. They said, oh, great. It was, it was well received, but that they went back to their seats after they told the story. And after about 30 seconds, two men dressed in black came up and whisked whisk Z out of the auditorium. John stood up and said, what are you doing? And they said, sit down and don't move. And after another three or four minutes, Z came back and sat next to him, and John said, what happened, what happened? He said, oh, there's a crazed killer on the loose who looked like me. So they pulled me out of there, interviewed me, and determined I wasn't uh, the crazed killer. I can't imagine anyone looking like Z, much less him being a crazed murderer. So that's the end of my shaggy dog story. The only thing I can say it may perhaps relate uh, softball to astronomy. Back to those persistent Leonid meteor trails. By the way, these lingering trails are characteristic of, but not unique to the Leonids. They are seen occasionally at, in other meteor showers, but they really stand out with the Leonids. In 1998, I was the observer. I sat out on the roof by the uh, three and a half meter telescope. When I saw a meteor that left a trail, I would call out its azimuth and elevation telescope would swing over with its uh, LIDAR attached and start m making measurements. It produced, these observations produced many papers and here's uh, the cover that was on the Journal of the Geophysical Letters in 2000 showing the, the three and a half meter with the uh, LIDAR going out and at the upper right you can see what a trail looked like and there we are probing it again with the LIDAR. 
uh, we put together the observations and I submitted a little article to Sky and Telescope. And oh, by the way, you can see on this meteor on the right uh, that was recorded by someone else, you can see that it left a lingering trail also. So this article was in Sky and Telescope. Here are some of the pictures from the article and some of the pages from the article. That's pretty cool. I still get a thrill out of anything I put in Sky and Telescope, probably more than I do in referee journals. And here are some of the examples that we had from these uh, lingering trails. Notice how some of them, like the ones in the upper left and the upper right, leave parallel trails. And that was not understood until we went through this campaign. And in some of these, you can see the LIDAR uh, striking it in the upper right. Or in the lower left, you can see a laser coming in from the left. In the lower right, you can see it coming in from the upper right. We gave these fanciful names. The upper left meteor trail was the diamond ring. The upper right was the rubber band. The lower left we call the French curve. And the lower right was the glowworm. I'll explain why they're called glowworms in a second. Now, one of the results that came out of this campaign was an, the an analysis of the standing theory at the time, which is was called shell burning. From our, our observations, we determined that this was not the case. If you look at the diagram on the right, if there's only light coming from the shell, you, you see more of it on the edges, but you still get light coming from the middle. And if you look at our image on the left, and, and uh, if you can see stars between the parallel trails, and we determined that it was actually no emission coming from anywhere in the middle. So these are two independent trails. There's not shell burning. But the emission is due to the Chapman cycle, which was uh, put forward in the 1930s. The incoming sodium, the incoming meteor brings in sodium, which combines with ozone, to produce sodium oxide and diatomic oxygen. This sodium oxide now combines with monatomic oxygen to produce an excited state of sodium and more diatomic oxygen. This excited state then decays to the ground level and it produces the same uh, sodium D-line as we produce in, by the, our lasers. The sodium is a catalyst, it's not destroyed, and this whole thing is uh, produces is produce produces cold light, which is the same as bioluminescence, the same thing that produces light in fireflies and some fish in the sea. The larvae of fireflies are glowworms, hence we termed these glowworms in the sky. The next meteor storm from the Leonids is going to be in 2033, and you should be able to see a lot of these lingering trails. After this. We formed our team to observe at large telescopes, and here I am on Mauna Kea with uh, getting ready to observe at the Gemini telescope, which is an 8 meter. But in the background here are the two 10 meter telescopes with adaptive optics and a laser, KEX 1 and KEX 2. No one knows which is which. The, the, the telescope on the left is the, an infrared telescope of 4 meters, and on this particular night is when we discovered the moon around Roxanne. Here are some images from my greatest night ever of four asteroids. The asteroids are on the left column. If I take an FFT of those images, you get the second column. The more rings you see, the larger the asteroid. In the third column are my fit of the FFT, showing the, all those ripples. And on the right is if I, if I inverse the FFT, I get back my deconvolved image from the image on the left. Here's an example of the asteroid Antigone observed that night. You can see in the top two rows the resolved asteroid rotating and changing shape. The bottom two rows show the model that's been derived from light curves. Uh, this, these compare very well. You can say that our AO observations agree with the model and that, our, and that the models support the results that we get from AL. A triaxial ellipsoid projects an ellipse, 
an ellipse has a long axis and a short axis. In this diagram for Antigone, the long axis of that ellipse is the top curve, and the middle solid curve is the short axis, projected by a triaxial ellipsoid that fits our observations, which are the four, uh, the five squares in the top diagram. The bottom diagram shows the changing position angle. So from our measurements, these from our five measurements, we derive a triaxial ellipsoid that produces these lines, and that's how we get our triaxial ellipsoid dimensions and rotational poles. Here is a figure lifted out one of our papers that shows observations of Romulus around Sylvia made at the SOR. The left three columns are the first night that we found Sylvia. The right three columns are the last nights that we observed it. In each case, the left column, the top, is the raw image. It's just what you would get out of the camera. Below it is the log of that image. The next column over is my Lorentzian fit of that image, my fit of the asteroid. The bottom is the log of that fit. And if you subtract the images at the top, it should make the satellite pop out because it's not part of my fit. Or in the bottom, you divide the log, divide the logs, and the and the satellite should pop out. And you can see this more in the uh, third column on the bottom. There's Romulus hanging out next to Calliope. I'm sorry, uh, next to Sylvia. On the right side, the it's harder to see because it was really close. There's an arrow pointing in the log on the bottom right of Romulus. Here's another figure lifted out from the paper in which we derived the first ever orbit for uh, at satellite Olympias around Roxanne. They're from images from the four telescopes that we use, the Gemini 8 meter, VLT, which is the very large telescope in Chile, 8 meter, the Keck 10 meter, and the SOR 3.5 meter. On the left four panels, we show the orbit that we've derived, and you may or may not be able to see the satellite. But if you subtract out the model of the asteroid that I derive on the right four panels, then you can easily see the satellite. Later, from the three and a half, we I show images of Calliope and Linus. You can see the satellite rather clearly, even without re removing the, the asteroid. And you can see in the top panel how bright it is compared to the asteroid. Late last year, we looked at Calliope and Linus again, but this time with the one and a half meter. And also, in this case, you cannot see the asteroid in the top images. I'm sorry, the satellite in the top images. You don't see it until you subtract out the point spread function of the asteroid and look for the signal of the satellite in the residuals, which show up much better to the lower right and to the lower left in the bottom row. This is an incredible observation with only a one and a half meter telescope. And the observation on the right in December of last year was made at an elevation of only about 30 degrees. So why do we care so much about uh, satellites around asteroids? It turns out to be the only way you can get density of these objects short of a spacecraft flyby. You can go all the way back to Kepler's three laws. The third one shows that the orbital period squared is proportional to the distance between them cubed. Newton later showed and derived what the proportionality constant was, and rearranging it, we can see that the mass of the objects is proportional again to the distance cubed over the period squared. So if we have the mass of the objects from our orbit, we can determine the volume of an asteroid from our triaxial fit of the asteroids and do that in one night. Satellites are so small that we can give all of the mass to the asteroid and not the satellite. Density is just volume divided by mass. So it's our triaxial ellipsoid volume divided by the mass from the orbit. This gives us a density. It turns out for Sylvia and Romulus, with a density of 1.35, it's only a little bit larger than ice. So Sylvia and Romulus may be more have more ice in it than rock. And at the other end, Calliope, which has always been suspected to be more, but more metallic, indeed has a higher density. 
To give you a sense of the scale of these objects, the four satellites that we've looked at, here's the orbit of Peneus around Daphne compared to the state of New Mexico. Peneus goes around Daphne in 1.1 days, and Daphne looks like it would cover up most of Albuquerque and quite a bit more. For Sylvia and Romulus, Sylvia is quite large. It's about the size of the state of Arkansas. And Romulus goes from California back to California in about 3.6 days. Calliope and Lioness have a period of 3.6 days. Calliope is drawn over the Four Corners region. And Linus goes from, say, the Colorado-New Mexico border back and forth in 3.6 days. Now, for Roxanne and Olympias, Roxanne is fairly small. It's probably about the size of Albuquerque. And Olympias goes from Arizona-New Mexico border back to the same spot in only 8.26 hours. Other highlights from my time here at the SOR was the annular solar eclipse that occurred in May of 2012. I took a bunch of my grandkids out west of Los Lunas to look at it, and it turned out to be a little bit of a challenge. Kids running around throwing rocks at each other, going out in the street. They weren't paying much attention. I couldn't seem to get them to be that interested until I felt a little tug on my shirt, and one of my granddaughters said, Papa, what's happening? And I had the opportunity to explain it to her. Also was the transit of Venus. That was pretty spectacular, and speaking of spectacular, here's Bob's famous transit of Venus photograph, where he not only took this image, but tracked down the pilot and the flight, and flew to Kentucky, and presented him with this image. I'd like to say that not many people know this, but I'm famous, and here's, my, here's why, here's my asteroid. You can see on the left and the right, the arrow pointing to the to asteroid Drummond, it's hard to see, but in the middle two images you can see uh, Drummond quite clearly, taken with a three and a half meter telescope. And here is Bob Fugate's asteroid. Can you see it moving across the screen? I believe this was taken with his own equipment. So here is the retirement mat that the SOR gave me. At the upper left are, is the glowworm. Upper right is my asteroid. Lower left is the annular eclipse. And of course our telescopes with lasers at the lower right. Thank you for inviting me to give this talk. It has meant a lot to me. And one final thing is that any I think that anyone who's stood outside on a dark night and knows what they're looking at can't help but hear I am. I do have a postscript here though. I have 60 years, 720 issues of Sky and Telescope that I would like to give away to a good home. They're loose in cardboard boxes, but all in good shape. If you're interested, call me or get hold of me at this address on the screen. Once again, thanks everyone for listening to this. Yeah, thank you so much, Jack. That was great. <laughs> What a career. What a what a what a wonderful time. Does anybody have any questions for Jack? You can go ahead and unmute if you'd like. What was his batting average? <laughs> okay, Jack, spill it. Okay, I unmuted. Uh, I carry I actually kept the books, kept the stats for all this time, but my batting average is about 480. That's good for baseball, not that good for softball. I think I had asked you this question before, Jack, but is there any, and in fact, you did answer it, is there any telescope on the planet that can actually resolve visually an asteroid? And I think um, you answered it. Yes, the asteroids are actually, the larger asteroids are in a sweet spot between the atmospheric composed one to two arc seconds and the resolution of a telescope. So for instance, the largest asteroid series is about three quarters of an arc second in diameter. So before speckled interferometry, before adaptive optics, you couldn't resolve it. But once you can beat the atmosphere with adaptive optics, say, you can resolve it. <coughs> so 
So all the studies that we do, like I said, on my greatest night ever, going to Keck, we could resolve all the asteroids we looked at and simply watch them re uh, rotate and change shape and size throughout the night and derive their actual triaxial ellipsoid dimensions. So the larger asteroids, yes, you can resolve from large telescopes with adaptive optics from Earth. Thank you. Other questions? Uh, yes, uh, Stephen, Dr. Drummond, thank you. Um, I was just wondering if the Earth or Moon have any natural satellites, and I say natural to the well, my uh, first year at New Mexico State was Clyde Tombaugh's last year. And after he discovered Pluto, he began a search for natural satellites around the Earth, uh, funded by the Air Force, and never found any. And to this day, there are no permanent natural satellites around the Earth. There are some asteroids that make one or two or three or four revolutions around the Earth over several years, and then uh, they go away. So the Earth has no other natural satellites other than the moon. There's a, when I was teaching astronomy at CNM, we used to have a video of one of those temporary satellites. And it was, it was really interesting to watch because the moon, when it's in front of the moon, the moon slows it down. And when it's behind the moon, the moon's speeding it up. And eventually the moon just kicks it out. That's right. Yes. So it was fun to it was fun to show that to the students and to watch yeah, the dynamics I think it's fun. of it. I I think it's fun to watch that too. Yeah. <laughs> Other questions and comments. Lori, were you there before uh, when we were doing uh, those lingering trails, or yes. were you after that? No, I was there when I was there when we were doing the lingering trails. I. I was standing out there when we took that uh, glowworm picture. Yes, that, that knocked me out of my seat when that glowworm yeah. went by. It's on my uh, my going away poster from uh, from Starfire. It's it's one of the pictures on it. So. All right, great. <laughs> <laughs> All right. One of uh, my more interesting observing nights. I was at White Ridge Bike Trails. Uh, during the Geminid meteor shower one year, a couple of years ago, and observed uh, 3,200 feet on. Um, and you could watch it move through your eyepiece view within five or 10 minutes. You could see the, the movement of that asteroid, which is wow. unusual. When you're yeah, looking at asteroids, usually you're waiting for several hours to detect the movement of it. So it must have come near the Earth. Was that the same night as the Geminids? Yes, indeed. Oh, wow. You, so you got the, the mother and the daughter. Right. That was, uh, I think the location of it was, I don't know if it was mentioned in Sky Intel or, or not. I don't remember, but I do remember finding it. And, you know, it's quite interesting when you see an asteroid and you can detect the movement yes. within a number of minutes. It's really fun. Yep. Must have really been close to the Earth. Anybody else? Well, with that, Jack, thank you again for presenting to us. We really appreciate it. And thank, uh, thank you for Lori, indulging me. Thank you. And Lori, turning it back over to you. All right. Thank you. Um, well, I don't think we have any other announcements. I just noticed there's something in the chat window. And Steve, you go, you will send me the uh, the video uh, so I can post on, on the. Uh, yes, I I sure will. So I think if uh, if there's nothing else, no more questions or anything else to say, we already covered the announcements. Our next meeting is March fourth, the only day that's a date and a command. So. Um, <laughs> And as Melanie said, we're going to have uh, an astronomer from UNM talk to us, and she's involved with uh, 
James Webb, as well as some other interesting things. So that'll be very exciting. And we will see you all in four weeks. And Jack, you're always welcome to drop in on our meetings. We're, I mean, this month we did strictly online, but we frequently do hybrid. So, okay, sure. Uh, you can drop in as, as a Zoom person or come in person to our observatory up in Rio Rancho. And it's pretty interesting. We have some nice telescopes, of course, nothing like a three and a half meter with adaptive optics, but. Wouldn't that be nice? <laughs> yes. yes. What's the largest telescope you have there? We have a 25. 25 inch? Uh -huh. Wow, that's the same size I did my dissertation on with. <laughs> wow. All there right. you go. Well, our, our 25 inch is a, is a daub, so um, it doesn't, it won't track. Yeah. But Pretty spectacular views of the Milky Way then. You get some nice views. All right, well, I think um, we are done. And like I said, I will see you all in four weeks, hopefully many of us in person. Okay. And everybody stay warm. Yes. And um, one last one last point announcement. Um, White Ridge, next White Ridge will be the last week in February, so uh, watch the um, emails. Um, hopefully, the weather will be more cooperative. But uh, I'll be shooting. I'll, I'll start the emails probably like the Sunday before. Okay. All right. All right. Well. Sounds good. Well, thank you, Steve, for. Uh, Hosting the Zoom again. We appreciate no it. Thank no you. No problem. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and stop recording now.